Nyanya's case, uh, on Thursday is that Edith Everett will be here as the introducer for Eli on that day. So please make sure you come on Thursday as well. Eli, without further ado, the title is Nuremberg Epilogue, Nazi Criminals Escape Justice. Good morning. Thank you, Doug. Uh, uh, can everyone hear me? It's, it's great to be back in, in this idyllic location. Uh, special thanks to the Robert H. Jackson Center uh, for, for bringing me and, and my wife Cynthia back to Chautauqua this year. Uh, it's a remarkable institution. Uh, any of you uh, uh, who, has, who have not been to Jamestown to see the Jackson Center, uh, you really are, are missing something very important and, and you need to do it. Uh, thank you, uh, Doug Neckers, Professor Doug Neckers, who did most of the heavy lifting for this uh, wonderful study we have here in Chautauqua, to Greg Peterson, to um, uh, Carol and Rod Drake um, of, of the Jackson Center, to our wonderful hosts, um, Jerry and Marshall Hoffs at the Everett Jewish Life Center, to Edith Everett for creating that magnificent center that in just a, a few short years has become an essential part of the fabric of, of life at, at Chautauqua, and also to my good friend, Professor John Barrett. My subject this morning is the post-World War II escape from justice of perpetrators uh, of the Holocaust and other Nazi crimes. Um, uh, having uh, investigated and prosecuted Nazi criminals for more than 25 years uh, in the U.S. Justice Department, I've had an extended opportunity to examine key documents and uh, discuss these issues uh, with, with some of the major participants and, and certainly uh, uh, observers. Uh, my Justice Department unit, the Human Rights and Special Prosecutions section, is still investigating and prosecuting Nazi cases at this late date, in, in addition to our caseload of, of matters involving Bosnia, Rwanda, Guatemala, and other sites of post-World War II atrocities. Uh, however, please, uh, one caveat, uh, the opinions and conclusions I'll offer this morning do not necessarily represent uh, the views of my employer, the United States Department of Justice. Indeed, much of the subject matter that I'm about to discuss has never come within the purview of the Justice Department uh, in, any, in any fashion, as I think will, will be obvious. Let's get started then. Uh, as Allied troops fought their way uh, across Europe in 1944 and 45, uh, they came across terrible scenes of atrocities such as, as here. This is the Nordhausen concentration camp in central Germany. Uh, thousands and thousands of inmates were, were slaughtered there uh, or succumbed to the uh, terribly inhumane conditions. One of the little known or, or lesser known features, so to speak, of Nordhausen was that there was an underground B-2 missile factory not far from the camp in which Nordhausen inmates were worked under grotesquely inhumane conditions to build the very first uh, long-range missile, a missile that uh, wreaked destruction on uh, London and Antwerp and, and elsewhere. And these poor inmates uh, forced not only to work under these inhumane conditions, which caused them to perish in, in large numbers, were forced to work on weapons that they knew would be used uh, against uh, civilian populations, against the Allies. The operations director of uh, this underground factory known as the Nittelwerke, the Central Works, is again located under Kuhnstein Mountain near the concentration camp, was Arthur L. H. Rudolph. You see him here in his uh, wartime Nazi identity uh, booklet, uh, his photograph, of course, a couple of swastika stamps in, in circles. Uh, uh, he helped run the place. In fact, it was his idea. We have captured Nazi documentation proving this, his idea to use concentration camp inmates to build these, these weapons, and that alone uh, uh, makes him complicit in a, a crime against humanity. People who were uh, uh, convicted at Nuremberg, like Albert Speer, for doing that. Well, um, as the Allies came across these terrible scenes, uh, they were rounding up the, the most senior uh, Nazi uh, leaders, Nazi criminals, uh, and they were uh, initially the most senior of them, confined in a facility codenamed Ashcan. It was, in fact, the uh, former uh, palace hotel in Mondorf-sur-la-Bain, uh, sur uh, Luxembourg, and, and uh, uh, you can 
can see it here in this, in this still, that's what it looked like before the war. Uh, Hermann Goering and other senior Nazi figures were, were held there and were questioned there. Uh, in August of 1945, uh, they were uh, required to uh, gather for a, a group portrait. And uh, there uh, in Ashcan, uh, they were interrogated by some of the best interrogators that the U.S. military had, and occasionally the Soviets visited and, and did likewise. Uh, no one better uh, than this man. Uh, that's Colonel Ken Heckler. He's sitting right here. <laughs> Colonel Ken Heckler. I believe you were Major uh, uh, Ken Heckler at, at the time. Um, and he's here. Uh, you must see his, his latest book, which is uh, a compilation of these uh, extraordinary interrogation reports uh, it's amazing, I mean, how many of them have survived. It's a huge book. You have an interest, especially in how World War II was actually waged. It's, it's essential reading. Uh, and um, uh, uh, I think we can reveal it now. Greg Peterson, founder of the Jackson Center, is going to interview him right here uh, on Thursday after my presentation on the, the John uh, Dimiano case. Actually, it's going to be today. Today, yeah. after I speak, sorry, it'll be today, so don't leave. Don't tell me. Uh, no matter how boring Don't tell anybody, that's highly <laughs> secret. Okay, don't want to tell us all. Um, before the trial, um, uh, uh, at Nuremberg, uh, to which these, many of these people, like Goering, were removed, uh, they were also interviewed, as Greg said, by psychiatrists, and as, as, as uh, Doug rather mentioned, uh, we're deeply fortunate to have Howard Trieste with us. Uh, he'll be interviewed. As, as Sullivan used to say, right, right here on this stage uh, tomorrow, got that right. And tonight, as Doug mentioned, at 5.30 in the Chautauqua Theater, uh, you will see, uh, if you go, a remarkable, it's, it's one of the most remarkable life stories uh, told in a truly remarkable film. Um, I don't want to give any more of that away. Um, and here is Howard Trieste in the uniform uh, that he wore at, at, at Nuremberg. Uh, and again, I, I, I promise you, you don't want to miss that. Well, uh, eventually it was decided that these people needed to be tried, and uh, tried they was the rare uh, color photo of Justice Robert H. Jackson, the principal architect of the trial. The photo was taken by the late Ray Diodario of the U.S. Army Signal Corps. Uh, Ray was a great uh, friend and supporter of, of the Jackson Center. Well, everybody knows, it's probably hard to read back there, how the, how the trial ended. Uh, most of the Nazi criminals were convicted, uh, quite a number were executed, and others were sentenced to varying uh, terms of imprisonment. There were trials subsequently held by the United States, by uh, the Soviet Union, by the British government, and also by the national courts of the formerly occupied countries, including France. Altogether, thousands of Nazi criminals were convicted in post-war Europe. Uh, many of them were executed or sentenced to prison. No one knows the exact number, uh, in particular because the Soviets were always very secretive about that. They did not allow uh, Westerners to have access to their files. One of the better estimates I've seen is that something in the range of about 7,000 Nazi criminals uh, were prosecuted. Uh, an example of the post-Nuremberg, that is, after the very first Nuremberg uh, trial, the post, um, the so-called subsequent Nuremberg trials before U.S. military tribunals, is the case of uh, uh, the Einsatzgruppen leaders, the surviving uh, leaders of the notorious Nazi mobile killing units. That, that uh, case, which was at that time the biggest murder trial in history involving more than one million uh, men, women, children, and babies methodically shot to death uh, in the former Soviet Union. That trial was uh, uh, led by uh, Benjamin Ferenc. Uh, ben is, thank God, still with us. Also a great friend of the Jackson Center. He's, he's been to the center many, many times. Um, here is a, an example of what um, those mass shootings look like. Not, I don't believe this is, uh, not, I don't recall whether this is in fact one of the Einsatz group, but that's what those horrible scenes look like. Um, one of the uh, worst of the defendants in that trial uh, was a man by the name of uh, Martin Sandberger. Uh, there he is uh, as a prisoner at Nuremberg. Uh, he uh, commanded a unit of Einsatzgruppe A. Uh, Here's an excerpt from his Nuremberg testimony in which he's questioned about carrying out in Estonia Hitler's order to eliminate all Jews, gypsies, and communist functionaries. Question, 
You collected these Jews according to the basic order, didn't you? The Hitler order. Answer, yes. And then they were shocked. They were, they were shocked, weren't they? Isn't that right? Answer, yes. By members of your command? Answer, from the Estonian men who were subordinated to my Zonderkommando leaders, that is uh, also myself then. Question, then in fact they were shot by members under your command? Answer, yes. Then, as a result of the Fuhrer order, these Jews were shot? Answer, yes. Martin Sandberger was convicted and sentenced to death in 1948. All of his appeals failed as well they should have. Well, the uh, uh, Allied enthusiasm uh, for uh, pursuing justice uh, largely came to an end uh, as 1948 itself came to an end. Uh, uh, was that because most of the, part most of the uh, people who had participated in the perpetration of Nazi crimes against humanity had been brought to the bar of justice? Uh, the answer to that question, sadly, tragically, uh, and I can say emphatically, uh, is no. Uh, credible estimates of the number of perpetrators of the Holocaust alone, the systematic mass murder of some six million Jews, range uh, from a minimum of about 100,000 to more than 300,000 and even 600,000. The actual number, I suspect, is somewhere in that 300 to 600,000 range. Well, if less than 10,000 of the three to 600,000 perpetrators were prosecuted, the tragic reality is that the vast majority, the vast majority of the men and women who took part in these crimes escaped justice entirely. How did they get away? Unfortunately, the answer to that question is bound up and has been for decades in a fog of myths, legends, distortions, and, I'm sad to say, outright fabrications. There are times, I must confess, when I fear that the truth will never vanquish falsity uh, regarding this subject. The myths have been uh, buttressed, so to speak, by at least five decades of literary and cinematic thrillers uh, originating uh, from the uh, likes of Frederick Forsyth, Robert Ludlum, John Le Carre, Ira Levin, and other talented writers. So, um, if you'll permit me, I'd like us to look at the myths first. Here, I think, are the ways in which most people think that the perpetrators of Nazi crimes against humanity got away. One, a super secret escape organization of Nazis, codenamed Odessa arranged escape routes for them. Two, the perpetrators assumed false identities, enabling them to elude allied authorities who were searching for them. Three, U.S. intelligence agencies, the intelligence services of other nations, also the Vatican, and other Western institutions knowingly helped them escape. Four, most of the Nazi criminals managed to, to find safe haven in South America, where they lived in splendor owing to the protection that they received from Latin American dictators in exchange for certain quote-unquote services that they provided. And five, independent Nazi hunters, among whom the most famous was, of course, Simon Wiesenthal, were able to track down Adolf Eichmann and most of the other senior perpetrators but European and Latin American governments simply ignored the information that they provided. Well, like many myths, uh, there are kernels of truth, truth to each of these beliefs, but none of them, none of these beliefs, myths, individually or collectively, explains more than a very tiny component of the Nazi cases. The Odessa File, a best-selling book by Frederick Forsyth, a true page turner, turned into a motion picture starring John Voight, very successful film. The Odessa name was supposedly an acronym in, in German for former uh, members of the SS, I don't recall the exact acronym any longer. It's a myth, was invented. Uh, were, were there uh, uh, eight groups that were where former Nazis helped one another escape, sure. Were there groups of Nazis who banded together, sure. 
Was there an organization like Odessa that existed to, to help Nazis escape justice and, and flee uh, from their pursuers in any significant way? No, there was not. Second myth, the one about false identities. Well, you know, it's actually harder than you might think, especially back then, to, to get a false identity. If you were a senior perpetrator and you had the, uh, the connections, maybe you could do it. Uh, some of them certainly did. But you know what? It really wasn't necessary for most of these people to assume identities. They just had to lay low for a few years. And then after 1948, when efforts to, to find them dropped off precipitously, they generally could come out with their, their regular names. So most of them kept their given names. U.S. intelligence. There were indeed some instances in which intelligence agencies and other post-war governmental institutions helped Nazi criminals evade justice. One of the best known cases is that of Klaus Barbie, the notorious Gestapo chief of Lyon, France, the so-called Butcher of Lyon. Among the murders that he perpetrated, uh, members of the French resistance and Jewish school children. Uh, in, uh, uh, he was found in Bolivia in the 1980s and was eventually uh, sent to France uh, where he was put on trial and, and convicted. He died in, in prison. He was, uh, how did he get to Bolivia? He was aided by the U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corps, which had used his services after the war. Uh, and when uh, my office, my previous office, the Office of Special Investigations, undertook a uh, uh, study, uh, an investigation of, of, of that, uh, we confirmed that CIC had indeed used Barbie and aided him in escaping to Latin America, South America. Uh, we uh, issued a report, got it declassified by the Reagan administration, and persuaded that administration to release it to the public. You can read it on, on the internet. We also persuaded the Department of State to issue a formal public apology to the families of Barbie's victims uh, and to the uh, government and people of France. Another example, we spoke of Arthur Rudolph before. What I didn't tell you before was that he was brought to the United States along with Werner von Braun and other leading German and Austrian scientists and engineers in a once secret, top secret program called Project Paperclip. And uh, Rudolph was put to work, like many of them, on the uh, first the U.S. military missile program. And then after President Kennedy announced in 1961 that we would attempt a lunar landing within the decade of the 1960s, many of these people switched over to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. One of those people was Arthur Rudolph. He was, as I indicated before, heavily implicated in the perpetration of Nazi crimes, he should not have been brought to the United States because President Truman's then top secret directive authorizing the program forbade uh, the government from employing any ardent Nazis or war criminals. Meanwhile, Rudolph's original security evaluation by the U.S. military was uh, had him as ardent Nazi, dangerous type, and then it said suggest internment, and I believe there were two or three exclamations. But None of that happened. He was brought to the United States and he was put to work on the Saturn V program. And he actually was in charge of the construction of the Saturn V rocket, the biggest rocket ever built. Uh, and there he is standing in, in front of, of his uh, biggest creation. And so it is um, a sad part of our history that a Nazi slave master built the rocket that took humankind to the moon in 1969. Uh, my office found him in the early 1980s. I questioned him after uh, directing the investigation that unearthed a great deal of incriminating information, including his own interrogation uh, that was conducted for a post-war trial of Nordhausen perpetrators. And faced with the evidence, um, he and his lawyer decided it would be best for him to return to Germany, which he did. We then uh, exposed him, revealed what he had done, shared our information with German authorities, they did not prosecute him, and he died a free man there in or about the year 2000. I wanted to show you one more thing about Rudolf. Uh, once again, the Nazi ID 
uh, uh, from his uh, identity booklet. Uh, this time I've added a red arrow pointing to a rectangular stamp. It, it took a while for us to, to figure out what that said because it's, it's kind of shaky uh, when it was uh, not so carefully imprinted. That's a, a, a British uh, military stamp uh, reflecting his post-war initial employment uh, in Europe uh, jointly by American and British forces uh, to test launch captured B-2. So rather than issue him a new identity card, they just took his Nazi identity card and stamped it British. So there's that old saying that a photo is pictures worth a thousand words, and I think this, this proves that, that concept. Uh, no, uh, this is um, uh, a picture of a German army officer uh, taken at Podgorica, Yugoslavia on May 22, 1943 during a, uh, a vicious German operation there, uh, codenamed Unternehmen Schwarz, the Black Operation. Thousands and thousands of, of people were murdered, civilians were murdered in the course of the conducting of that operation and there he is right in the middle of it. Can't see the rest of the photo, but he's uh, surrounded by war criminals. Anybody uh, recognize this man? Yeah. Okay. He was a, became president of something in Austria. That's exactly right. It's uh, Kurt Baltheim, uh, who uh, spent the 70s as Secretary General of the United Nations, where he liked to call himself the Chief Human Rights Officer of the planet Earth. His Nazi past was revealed at last in 1986. Uh, he was involved in uh, the perpetration of atrocities, uh, uh, and I should really say the facilitation of the perpetration of atrocities uh, in the former Yugoslavia. It's a very long story. I, I wrote an entire book about it that's long out of print. Um, as a result of the disclosure of his Nazi past, uh, some of you will remember that Baltheim was formally barred uh, by the United States in 1987 from ever re-entering this country. Uh, and that was in particular on, on the basis of uh, proofs that were assembled by my former office. I, I was accused from, from that matter because I was involved in the Valheim uh, affair, so to speak, uh, outside the Justice Department. Um, the, the revelations, by the way, included uh, discoveries that Valheim had been charged as a Nazi mass murderer after the war by Yugoslav authorities and had even been listed in 1948 as a wanted war criminal by, believe it or not, the United Nations War Crimes Commission. So how did he become the Chief Human Rights Officer of the planet Earth in 1971? And how did he serve two full terms as Secretary General through 1981 without the truth coming out until five years after he left office and was running uh, successfully for the presidency of Austria? Uh, the answer is, the Yugoslav government knew the truth, but they covered up for him. So did the Soviets. In fact, in the 1971 elections to succeed Utah at the United Nations, the Soviets basically vetoed every other candidate, including, to the surprise of many, uh, the Finnish ambassador. After all, back then, uh, Finland pretty much had to, uh, had to do whatever it, it, was necessary to avoid conflicting with the Soviet policy. Uh, so you would have thought that the Soviets would be delighted to have a Finn as the UN Secretary General, but no, they wanted Waldheim. Of course, the Finnish ambassador, uh, Max Jakobsen, uh, had the additional disability, so to speak, of, of being a Jew. Uh, well, why did the Yugoslavs and the Soviets cover up for him? Uh, I believe it was to promote Soviet and Yugoslav intelligence operations in the United States. Back then, uh, the UN was probably the principal base for communist intelligence operations in the United States. My uh, long ago book on the Valheim case explains the logic of this and, and the proofs of this. It's long out of print, but used copies are widely available on the internet. So yes, in some, there were instances in which post-war governments used Nazi criminals and helped them escape justice. I, I can certainly cite other examples. Sometimes, in doing these things, governments knew the truth. Sometimes they had reason to suspect, but found it convenient to look the other way and not discover the truth. And sometimes they were gen genuinely ignorant. Certainly, uh, post-war intelligence involvement with Nazis 
has long been the stuff of newspaper headlines and profitable risks for novels and motion picture thrillers. But it cannot be seriously suggested that these cases, cases involving foreign intelligence, U.S. intelligence, uh, it can't be seriously suggested that these cases in the aggregate amounted to more than a microscopic percentage of the hundreds of thousands of Nazi criminals who succeeded in escaping uh, their post-war uh, appearances or evading their post-war appearances at the bar of justice. Uh, as to the back, yes, to be sure, there was some involvement on the part of some Vatican officials in aiding Nazis who were trying to escape justice. Here is an example. At the far right, you see the former commandant of the Treblinka death camp, Franz Paul Stangl, uh, during the war, uh, between 870,000 and 925,000 Jews were murdered at Treblinka. Commandant Stangl was notoriously brutal. He was eventually found in Brazil, extradited to Germany, tried, convicted there, and sentenced in 1970 to a very unusual, unusually long sentence by German standards, the maximum life in prison. Here's Treblinka death camp today. It was destroyed after the courageous uprising by Jewish prisoners. Uh, and uh, uh, today there is nothing really left of it, but these are stones that have been placed each one representing a Jewish community uh, whose members were murdered at Treblinka. Bishop, Vatican Bishop, Alois Udal, he helped numerous Nazis get away, among them Stangl, whom he helped escape to Syria, from which the former Treblinka commandant was later able to flee to Brazil. Here's an interesting document probably can't read it from where you are. I've, I've placed a red arrow uh, on part of it. This is Stangl's post-war Red Cross immigration documentation. And the one line in particular says, address in Rome, uh, that's the translation obviously, address in Rome, Via Delle Pace number 20. Well, that turns out to have been Bishop Hudal's residence in Rome. So, uh, Although, again, as in the case of intelligence utilization, while there were instances of assistance, even knowing assistance, uh, given to fugitive <coughs> Nazi criminals uh, by certain Catholic Church officials, it can't seriously be suggested uh, that these cases amounted to more than a tiny percentage of the hundreds of thousands of Nazi criminals who succeeded in evading their post-war appointment to speak with justice. As for South America, Without question, some Nazi criminals did manage to flee to South America, where, with only five or so exceptions, they were able to live out their lives. The best known case, of course, is that of Adolf Eichmann, whom you see here on trial in his uh, so-called the glass box, the supposedly a bulletproof enclosure in Jerusalem in 1961. He was responsible for the deportation of millions of Jews to their deaths at Auschwitz and other Nazi camps. He was famously abducted in 1960 in Buenos Aires, Argentina, by Israeli intelligence agents. And he was flown to Israel, where he stood trial in Jerusalem the next year. He was convicted. And of course, he was executed. I've already mentioned Klaus Barbie, who was found in Bolivia, sent to France in 1983. Another well-known case, uh, Dr. Joseph Mengele, seen here at the far left, at the Auschwitz death camp complex. Uh, he was the notorious Auschwitz selector and experimenter, and for decades he was the most um, eagerly uh, sought after uh, war criminal in the world, or I should say he was theoretically the most eagerly sought after. There really wasn't much of an effort on the part of uh, Germany in which he had been charged to find him. Uh, in 1985, a joint US-German-Israeli effort to, to, to track him down uh, led to a shallow grave at Imbu, Brazil. It turned out he had died in Brazil in 1979. He had a stroke while swimming. As a physician, he knew exactly what was happening to him. This is uh, way down on my list of ways that uh, I, I, I would like to die. Uh, but uh, die he did. Uh, and, uh, uh, Germany could have found him years earlier by following the money trail. He had a very wealthy family in Germany. 
They, they own a, a large farm equipment company and they were secretly supporting him. The way that we finally found Mengele was indeed following the money. But again, uh, I believe that comparatively few Nazi criminals fled to South America. Doing so requires significant resources that most lack. More important, as I said, indicated before, few of them really needed to because if they could lay low through 1948, the law enforcement effort in Europe uh, to apprehend them by, at around then uh, largely uh, uh, fizzled out. So the overwhelming majority of the perpetrators of Nazi crimes, in fact, remained where they had been at war's end, in Germany and Austria. And that is surely where the overwhelming majority of the surviving Nazi criminals remain today. Uh, finally, as to this idea that the Nazi hunters found them, knew where they were, reported them to the authorities, and the authorities did nothing, it is certainly true that authorities uh, did not do what they should have done. Uh, and that's true of our own country as well. But uh, really, this is what I call the Hollywood conception of the post-war fate of, of Nazi uh, war criminals, uh, best exemplified by the movie Boys from Brazil, uh, which uh, features a, a Nazi hunter figure uh, based on Simon Wiesenthal, the character uh, having been played by Sir Lawrence Olivier, no less. Uh, Simon Wiesenthal and Beata Quarsfeld uh, in France did hugely important work and in the case of Mrs. Clarsfeld, truly courageous work, to shine the light of public attention on the scandal of unpunished Nazi criminals who were at liberty in Europe uh, and elsewhere, including South America. Without their efforts, uh, I think it is likely, it is, it's a virtual certainty, in fact, that the investigation and prosecution of Nazi criminals would have ended completely at some point uh, in the 1960s. In truth, however, from the 1950s onward, hardly any of the criminals were actually found as a result of investigative work by Simon Wiesenthal or other independent so-called Nazi hunters. When they were able to point to the location of one or another Nazi criminal, it was generally on the basis of tips from people who, for whatever reason, turned the criminals in. And that was an important function. They served as sort of a, a post office box for those uh, tips. What I consider the, to be the legend of the Nazi hunters uh, is principally traceable to, to one case, that of Adolf Eichmann. Simon Wiesenthal catapult, catapulted to worldwide fame in the early 1960s on the basis of his purported role in Adolf Eichmann's 1960 apprehension in Buenos Aires. Wiesenthal vigorously asserted his claim to participation in that historic event, and he insisted throughout his lifetime on being introduced at his public speaking engagements as the man who had tracked down Eichmann. In truth, however, uh, the Israeli intelligence operation that found um, and, and uh, uh, abducted Eichmann in Argentina had no significant contribution from Mr. Wiesenthal. Indeed, in 1959, as the Israelis were gearing up, based on a, a tip uh, from a, a, a European Jewish immigrant uh, to Argentina who discovered uh, that his daughter was dating Eichmann's son and who passed the tip on to the uh, German prosecutor who tipped off the Israelis. So just as the Israelis were preparing to try to capture Eichmann in Argentina, Mr. Wiesenthal was advising the Israelis in writing that he had at last deduced where Eichmann was probably hiding. And where was it, he wrote? Northern Germany. Oops. Uh, unfortunately, um, this kind of failure and, and showman, showmanship were, were stocks in trade for the late Mr. Wiesenthal. Uh, the Mengele case is another example. For well over a decade, he fooled reporters into publishing his claims that he, Simon Wiesenthal, was on the verge of arranging for Mengele's arrest in this South American country, that South American country. In the end, uh, as I said, it turned out that Mengele had already been dead for years. And by the way, that he'd been living in just about the only country of South America that Simon Wiesenthal had not identified as his hideout, Brazil. For anyone who's, who's interested, uh, the subject of, of Mr. Wiesenthal's claims is addressed at considerable length in my 1993 book on the Baldheim Affair, and I also explain why it was that Kurt Baldheim's principal public defender was Simon Wiesenthal. 
Well, so much for the misconceptions and, and myths. How then did the vast majority of perpetrators, Nazi perpetrators, escape justice? There were principally, in my judgment, two, 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 two explanations for what happened. Two factors. The first factor is the onset or the revival uh, after World War II of the Cold War. The hot war in Europe had ended, and actually the Cold War re-erupted even before the hot war ended. Uh, East-West tensions brought an end to cooperation in pursuing Nazi criminals. Not entirely surprising since East and West were, uh, even in, in uh, uh, 1945, in the closing days of the war, competing to see who could get the best, so to speak, of the Nazi scientists and engineers. So it brought an end to the cooperation that we had seen after the great international trial at Nuremberg, in which this country was so brilliantly represented by Justice Robert Jackson. A formerly classified British government document is emblematic of what happened. In this 1948 document, uh, His Majesty's government explains that uh, the United Kingdom is going to end the its, its efforts to prosecute Nazi war criminals uh, by the end of 1948. And the, uh, it's a cable that goes to the uh, foreign uh, offices of the Commonwealth countries that were involved in uh, waging the war in Europe, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, India, Pakistan, and Ceylon, former Ceylon. Uh, and uh, so they write, in general, no fresh trials should be started after 31st August 1948. This would particularly, it says, affect cases of alleged war criminals not now in custody who might subsequently come into our hands. And it explains uh, that uh, this is necessary because um, of uh, future political developments in Germany, meaning East and West need their half of Germany to fight the Cold War. And um, it includes this remarkable uh, sentence that because of these developments, quote, we, I, I, I'm always tempted to say this in British English, but I'll, I'll, I'll restrain myself. Uh, we are convinced, it says, that it is now necessary to dispose of the past as soon as possible. And that's exactly what happened. The British stopped trying cases, the Americans stopped trying cases, um, and the Allied prosecution effort came to an end. This uh, cessation of cooperation uh, in pursuing justice on behalf of the victims of Nazi crimes had huge implications, by the way, for U.S. immigration policy. A large percentage of the Nazi criminals who immigrated to the USA after, uh, I'm sorry, in the late 1940s and in the 1950s, at least hundreds of, of, of people did that, hundreds of Nazi criminals, had perpetrated their crimes uh, uh, in uh, formerly German-occupied parts of the Soviet Union and the Baltic countries. Uh, the surviving Nazi documents uh, that proved their complicity in Nazi crimes had uh, frequently been captured by Soviet forces on those territories or in Poland or elsewhere, uh, but the Western governments and the Soviets weren't cooperating in, uh, as, uh, in the vetting of, of would-be immigrants to the West. And so at least, at least, as I said, hundreds of Nazi criminals were able to evade detection and immigrate to this country, to Canada, to Australia, and, other, and Britain, and other Western countries, because the proof of what they had done reposed in Soviet-controlled archives, or Warsaw Pact-controlled archives, or Yugoslavia, and we weren't permitted to have access to that information. A good example is this man, Jakob Reimer, an ethnic German Volksdeutsche from Ukraine who immigrated to this country in the early 1950s. In this slide, you see him in his uh, 1942 SS identity photo from uh, the uh, Travniki SS training and base camp in Nazi-occupied Poland, and also in his 1952 United States immigration visa photo. When he applied to immigrate to the United States in or about 1951, uh, Reimer concealed his wartime service at that Trevnity camp. His deception was actually discovered, and this is um, uncharacteristic of what happened, but in this case it happened. It was discovered by U.S. immigration authorities in Germany. Called in for questioning to explain this lie, um, he uh, insisted um, that although he, yes, hadn't disclosed his Trevnity service, it really didn't amount to anything, 
because he said Trebniki was just a regular military camp and he did nothing but sort of military support work. Well, um, U.S. authorities lacked any information uh, of, of any consequence on Trebniki, much less what Reimer himself had done. Uh, Poland by then was firmly within the Soviet orbit, and so the pertinent captured documentation wasn't available to, it, to us. In the absence of such information, and because Reimer was a very persuasive man, a uh, great liar, uh, the U.S. officials chose to believe him, and they permitted him to immigrate to this country. He ended up settling in the uh, New York City area. In truth, the Trebniki SS camp was, plain and simple, a school for mass murder. Uh, it's where the, the SS trained men to take part in roundups of Jews, to work at Nazi death camps and slave labor camps, to take part in mass shootings of Jews, and they even built a Jewish labor camp right next to the Trebniki SS camp so that the men would have real live Jews to train on. And in the end, they killed all of those Jews. Well, Reimer turned out to have been a non-commissioned officer there, and my office eventually found documentary proof that he took part in the gruesome Nazi liquidations of the Warsaw, Lublin, and Czestochowa Jewish ghettos in Nazi-occupied Poland. Here's a photograph of Travnicki men standing over uh, dead uh, women and Jews uh, in the Warsaw Jewish ghetto in April 1943. Well, we found Jack Reimer, as he then called himself, living in Carmel, New York. I think that's Rockland County. Uh, I'm, I'm from Long Island, where anything north of the Bronx is, uh, forgive me, I'm, in, I'm in up here. Anything north of the Bronx is upstate, and we don't really know what happens upstate. Uh, anyway, he was living in Carmel, New York. Uh, I questioned him. Uh, in Manhattan at the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York on May 1, 1992. Uh, it went on for hours. It was recorded on audio tape and stenographically recorded as well. And he readily admitted that he served the Trevnicki, but he hadn't really done anything. He never saw anybody die, certainly never took part in any killings, really didn't know anything about that, tried to appear very, very sympathetic, and eventually sort of, you know, peeling away the onion, closer and closer and closer, and finally he admitted, well, okay, there was this one time that he led his platoon of men on what he called a mission, quote, to liquidate a Jewish labor camp. And he explained how they went out, um, they had to overnight in, in the forest somewhere, and uh, he's trying to figure out what, what is Rosenbaum known, I'm first trying to figure out what, what's he going to tell me, um, and uh, uh, trying, uh, uh, putting on my best poker face, trying to look at least like I, I knew this story, which I did not, uh, and sensing that perhaps I didn't know. He said, well, I never, I didn't get there in time uh, for the killing. I, uh, I overslept, and the men went without me. Well, a uh, challenge uh, on that, I mean, uh, as, as uh, we said, uh, you know, it doesn't happen in any military or paramilitary or police formation in the world that the, 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 the of course, back then it would only be men, that the men go out without their commanding officer. Oh, well, did I say I was, no, 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 um, uh, I went with them, but I tripped. On the way to the execution site, I fell, I hit my head on a log, and I was knocked unconscious. By the time I came to, I raced over there, um, the killing was over, there was a sea of, of dead uh, and dying Jews, but the shooting had ended. And uh, I, I pressed him on this, and finally he said, well, okay, they're, 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 well, there was one man still alive in this pit, um, but um, he was pointing to his head. I, I was supposed to think that. I, this man wanted to die, I suppose. Um, and, and then this exchange. I said to him, there's something about the man who pointed to his head uh, that you haven't told me. This, by the way, is Reimer in the 1990s. There's something about this man who pointed to his head you haven't told me. Answer, yes. You finished him off. Answer, I'm afraid so. Uh, later at a trial in Manhattan, um, his lawyer ran so far for Attorney General of the United States. Uh, someone who's had quite a career defending war criminals from various conflicts, um, uh, argued that I'm afraid so uh, didn't mean yes. So we played the audio recording for the judge who got it that it meant yes. Uh, and um, uh, anyway, uh, the um, cessation of East-West cooperation also meant that investigators in West Germany and other Western countries who were trying to build prosecutable cases were denied access to the motherload of captured Nazi documents, namely those in Soviet archives. And the Soviets insisted on barring Westerners 
from their archives right through the ver very last day that the Soviet Union existed in 1991. And by the way, when the Soviets from time to time exposed a, publicly exposed a Nazi criminal in the West, something that they did with particular frequency in the 1960s and 1970s, um, uh, in part, I think, to uh, respond to uh, very compelling assertions made by Western governments concerning Soviet human rights violations. When, when those accusations were made, they tended to be dismissed as Soviet propaganda. In fact, the very first of those allegations, which was made against a man uh, named Carl Lennox, who lived in uh, Greenlaw in Suffolk County, Long Island. Uh, I remember uh, pulling up the uh, uh, article in the Long Island newspaper Newsday in 1961 that reported on that exposure, and the headline uh, of the article published right above an associated press piece offering continuing coverage of the Eichmann trial. The headline was something like, Reds, remember those days? Reds accused Long Islander of Nazi crimes. Uh, and how long did it take before the Justice Department finally investigated the case, uh, got the evidence, and saw fit to prosecute Carl Linus? Almost exactly 20 years. It wasn't until after my office uh, was created in the Justice Department in 1979 as a result of congressional pressure uh, that that happened, and we prosecuted Linus and succeeded and returned him to the Soviet Union, um, where he died before he could be tried. Now, it has to be said uh, that Soviet propaganda efforts were conducted often with a very heavy hand, and uh, they are, uh, for that reason and some other reasons, not entirely blameless, uh, so to speak, in the phenomenon of Western uh, suspicions of, of their accusations. The intensifying Cold War also gave great leverage to those of um, those in positions of power in post-war West Germany who wanted to secure the release of Nazi criminals who had been convicted, uh, imprisoned, and sometimes sentenced to death by the Allies. A good example is uh, that of an individual we previously discussed, uh, SS Standartenführer Martin Sandberg, the Einsatzgruppe leader who was convicted by our dear friend Ben Ferenc in 1948 and sentenced to death at Nuremberg. Well, as a result of pressure applied by German officials all the way up to the office of President, then President Theodor Heuss, uh, US authorities agreed at first to commute his Nuremberg death sentence to life imprisonment. And then they succumbed to further pressure to commute his sentence to time served. And as a result, uh, one day in 1958, Martin Sandberger walked out of Landsberg Prison in Germany as a free man and eventually settled in Stuttgart. And he did very well, especially for a man who was supposed to have been executed at the end of the 1940s. Here's where he was living until pretty recently in Stuttgart. That's his apartment complex on the left. On the right, maybe the people in the front row can see is an enlargement of his mailbox in that complex. And it says, Dr. Martin Sandberg. He uh, was a lawyer in post-war Germany. And, as a, and I know John and I are probably not the only lawyers in the room. I know we're not the only lawyers. Greg here is also another. Uh, it's rather embarrassing. Um, and here's a photo uh, of Sandberg taken surreptitiously in his Stuttgart apartment shortly before he died on March 30. 2010, at the age of 98. So he was supposed to be executed, and he got to live in freedom and comfort another, well, not entirely in freedom, but he lived another 60 years, about a half a century of that, in freedom. So the bottom line, very regrettable, is that Nazi criminals, Nazi war criminals, were among the very biggest winners of the Cold War. The other principal factor that I think accounts for their escape from justice is simply lack of political will. Uh, as I said, after the initial flurry of post-war interest in apprehending and prosecuting Nazi criminals, interest dropped off precipitously. In part, as I've outlined, this was a function of the Cold War tensions uh, that dominated East-West uh, relations in, in the post-war period, um, and it's not uh, uh, easy always to, to separate uh, the Cold War aspect from the lack of political will aspect, but I, I, I submit that there was a certain uh, war and Nazi fatigue setting in. 
The world had been shocked by what Allied troops discovered as they liberated the camps and by the evidence of genocide and other acts of, of nearly unimaginable cruelty that were disclosed at the first post-war trials by Robert Jackson and his colleagues and successors. But you know how the world works. It moves on quickly to the next crisis, the Korean War, the Soviet atomic bomb, the blockade of Berlin, the Red Scare, the supposed dangers of that outrageous new musical form called rock and roll, whatever. But that's what happened. Uh, one might have thought, or at least hoped, that the huge worldwide media attention that the Eichmann case received in 1960-61, and that the Auschwitz trial in Frankfurt am Main received in 1963-65, would have generated a change of heart on the part of government authorities around the world. Most assuredly, however, that did not happen. Uh, so, for instance, when a Nazi war criminal uh, was the first one exposed in Australia way back in 1961, at the time that Eichmann was on trial in Israel, that country's attorney general went before his country's legislature and explained why his government would do nothing to this man. And he had two explanations. First, he said, obviously referencing the origin of the uh, Western settlement of Australia, he said, Australia had always prided itself on being a country in which men could turn their, their backs on, the, on their pasts, how, however bitter, and start new lives. And second, he said, after all, World War II has been over for a long time. Yes, all of about 15 years. This lack of political will, I'm sorry to say, uh, largely persists to this day. Each year, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, which is named after the late Nazi hunter, but it has always been completely separate, does fabulous work. Um, each year for the last 11 years or so, the Wiesenthal Center publishes uh, an annual report on uh, global efforts to pursue the perpetrators of the Holocaust. Uh, and each year they assign ratings to some dozens of countries, academic style ratings of the kind that professors, uh, 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 the professors here are well familiar with, uh, from A to F. And uh, each year, uh, the United States has gotten the A rating. I'm very proud of the great work that my colleagues have done. And each of these 11 years, no other country gets an A. Most of them get Ds and Fs. The one exception being Germany, I think, in 2010, got an A because of their work with, uh, in partnership with my office on the Damiano case. But other than that, it makes for very depressing reading. In fact, the United States has prosecuted and won more cases in the past 25 years than all of the other countries of the world combined. Uh, the, therefore, the only country in which efforts to pursue justice on behalf of the victims of Nazi crimes was seriously revived is Justice Jackson's home country, the United States of America. And by the way, it's not because the majority of Nazi criminals came to the United States, a small minority of them did, but the political will eventually was here, at least after 1978. Uh, Austria, for example, has not prosecuted a Nazi case since 1970. European governments typically won't even accept back into their territories Nazi criminals whom we successfully prosecute for immigration and citizenship fraud here because that's the only jurisdiction that we have. Um, and then we seek to deport them, to return them to Europe. In almost every case, Germany and other countries of Europe, in effect, tell us to take a flying leap. They won't take it. And an example is a man we spoke of before, Jacob Reimer. Despite his admissions, Germany refused to take it. Jacob Reimer died in freedom in the United States. Uh, in Germany, I, I suspect, and I'll try to wrap this up shortly, uh, that prosecutors were dissuaded from bringing these cases by the unfortunate results obtained in many of the, those that did go to court. That is to say, acquittal or very light sentences that were completely inappropriate considering the gravity of the crimes. An example is the case of former SS officer Gunter Tabert, of, uh, whom you see here uh, in, his, uh, in photos from his SS personnel file. Uh, his crimes included the mass murder of the Jews of Dagov Pils in Nazi-occupied Latvia, in German, Dagov Pils is called Duniger. Uh, on November 9, 1941, 
Tamar and a mixed force of German and Latvian uh, personnel swept into this little town where the Jews had already been confined in a ghetto. They ordered the Jews out into the town square, machine gunned them to death using dum-dum bullets, tearing their bodies apart, went up into the apartments to find those who would not come out or could not come out and killed them, including babies, where they found them. A small number of Jews were out outside the town uh, working at slave labor sites, and they didn't even have the minimal decency to tell them, the so-called work Jews, what they would encounter when they came back that night, namely the bodies of their families and all of the other Jews of the town in, in peace, um, an almost uh, uh, inconceivably gruesome sight. And on November 11, 1941, Tabert wrote a report on that operation, and it's just three sentences. Here's the report. If you don't mind, I'll read the three sentences in English translation. It's entitled Jewish Action Unaxion in Duneburg. On 9 November 1941, 1,134 Jews were executed in Duneburg. By the way, no Nazi movements here, no uh, final solutions, anything like that. <clears throat> executed. And the word in German is almost the same execute here. The remaining Jews, he says, are employed at various service posts, various offices in the Duneburg area. And then the third and final sentence, one of the most chilling sentences I've ever read, because apparently 1,134 Jews was an inadequate death toll for Mr. Tabert. He writes, I ask that in a short period of time, these Jews, the work Jews, will also no longer be required for work. In 1993, Mr. Tabert, who uh, was free in Germany, uh, made the mistake of uh, coming to the United States as a tourist. He was uh, briefly stopped at Kennedy Airport, and then the uh, former Immigration and Naturalization Service uh, agents at the airport mistakenly led him into the United States, even though my office, actually not knowing whether he was dead or alive, had put him on a list of some 70,000 Nazi and Japanese World War II suspects who were to be barred from entering this country. So we got in, we tracked him down in New Orleans, Louisiana, and summoned him for questioning. And here he is from VHS tape uh, that we, we shot of that questioning, being questioned uh, at the immigration offices by one of my colleagues um, in 1993. And he, you know, admitted that he had this position in the SS, but he was very eager to show us a tattered newspaper clipping that I guess he thought one day he might, might need a German newspaper clipping reporting on his acquittal in Germany around, I think, 1970. Sure enough, that's what happened. The German court concluded that Tabert might have only been following off orders, that defense that was justly discredited in Nuremberg, but he might have only been following orders and might have feared, might have feared retribution if he had declined to do so. The court allowed that as a complete defense, and Tabert, also a lawyer, spent the rest of his life as a free man. But at least we saw to it that he never again polluted the atmosphere of our country. So in conclusion, tragically, the vast majority of the Nazi criminals, people who had murdered six million Jews and millions of others in cold blood got off completely scot-free. This terrible result constitutes a betrayal of the principles of justice for which Allied soldiers fought and died. It was a betrayal of the promise of Nuremberg as conceived by its key organizer and prosecutor, the legendary Robert H. Jackson. And most of all, a callous betrayal of the victims of Nazi inhumanity. We can only hope that going forward, uh, as uh, international tribunals and national courts uh, prosecute cases involving more recent atrocities, that th this history will not repeat itself. I have to say, however, having worked on these cases and the so-called modern war crimes cases uh, for many, many years, uh, it is difficult uh, to retain uh, some optimism about that. Thank you very, very much.